Good morning, everybody. It's we're coming so close to Christmas. Is anybody still shopping? <laughs> Graham, she's the only one. <laughs> well, how are we just thankful to have another day where we can worship Jesus and give him praise for all he has done? Amen. But well, if you're ready, let's stand. Let's give God praise this morning. Praise the Lord. Merry Christmas. Look at someone and say Merry Christmas. Pass it on. Pass it on. Merry Christmas. It's a beautiful thing. Merry Christmas for those watching online. We're so glad to join us. We're so glad each one of you are here today. You know, when we come together in a time like this, joining together, keeping Jesus Christ at the forefront. You know, we live in a world today that Jesus Christ isn't at the forefront. People are so busy doing this, so busy doing that, so busy, so busy. But there's going to be a moment in time that time's going to stop. And in that time where it stops, they're going to get a chance to see that the things they were so busy about weren't really important. Because the most important thing is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we put that first, that's when we really learn how to live. That's how we really learn to trust. That's how we really learn how to just live and have our being. So look at your name and say, I'm so glad you're here today. Look at big smile. Give him a big smile. Big smile. So glad you're here. So glad you're here. You know, some of you really increase your face value when you smile. I see it. I'm like, wow. A million bucks right there. Ken, smile. Go ahead. Look at that. <laughs> 
Monty, yay. <laughs> let's go before Father and let's ask God to have his way today. Father, we are grateful because of all you have done. Father, we celebrate every day because of the gift that keeps on giving. And I pray today that those watching online, those that are here, God, that your word would go forth. That, Lord, your Holy Spirit would touch individuals. And that we would truly, truly know who you are and all you desire to do in us and through us and around us. We'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, come on, give them some praise in the house of the Lord. Let's worship the Lord. for this beautiful time, Lord, that we get to celebrate your birth, the birth of Jesus Christ, who came to save and to seek those who are lost. We thank you, Lord, for that glorious night. It was a glorious night indeed. 
And Lord, help us never to stop proclaiming, Lord, like the angels who proclaimed that glorious night and the shepherds who, who couldn't not tell, oh God. Help us, Lord, to always shine your bright light, Lord, to all we are come in contact with, God. Oh, Father, we praise you, God. Lord, we give you the rest of this day, Father. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would just continue to move upon our hearts, oh God. Move in our lives, oh God, as we humbly seek you, Father. Help us, Lord. We so desperately need you, God. Help us to seek you more. Help us to know you deeper and better, Lord. We pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You are the first. You go before. You are the last. Lord, you're the encore. Your name's in lights for all to see. The starry host declare your glory. Glory in the highest. Glory in the highest. Glory in the highest. Apart from you, there is no God. Light of the world, the bright and morning star, your name will shine for all to see.
time Kenya hallelujah blessed be the name of the Lord hallelujah God is a good God and he's more than that this is a beautiful thing you know when I was just praising the Lord I was just saying God we can sing a song or we can sing a song when we make that your song when all of a sudden you're singing a love song unto Jesus it's not someone else's song that they wrote. It's now a song that you're singing unto God. When we sing the song, one of my favorites, O Come, Let Us Adore Him, or I think it's another name for that, right? O Faith, O, o Come, All Ye Faithful. But when I think of that song, I mean, God is so worthy of all our praise. Even when we're going through the mess. Look at someone and say, he's talking to you. Even, even when we're going through the mess, we can still bless because he has already blessed us already. The eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, nor has it into, my, into the mind of man the things that God has for them that love him. I mean, think of that. You haven't seen nothing yet. Look at your neighbor and say, you haven't seen nothing yet. Amen. Amen. Give God one more praise on how the Lord you may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I wanted to say a big thank you to all those who went caroling this Wednesday. Um, we end up going caroling all over the place, the different places, and, and some places gave us some cookies. Estella gave us some cookies, and, and uh, Leslie baked some cookies and did a bunch of stuff too. And, and then it was just nice, but that, we didn't go there for cookies, but that was all, like, we've never had so many cookies in one night. Uh, but... Um, 
but that being said, it was just so wonderful to be able to just sing and bless other people and just, it's beautiful to Carol. I love Carolyn. And just thank you all those who made it possible, all those that came. And of course, um, LT with his, his uh, guitar and uh, makes our voices sound so much better. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and so I wanted to show you a picture of everybody, but um, I didn't get to it, but we'll do a, a year run of everything and bring a bunch of pictures together this year. Um, but that being said, um, we've been praying on Friday nights, uh, Friday nights, Friday mornings, and, um, and it's, you know what? I'm so glad that Sister Joan wanted to pray and, spend, and bring us together, you know? And so because of all the holidays, we're gonna just hold up on that just because where it falls. But we're gonna start up fresh on the new year. And I'm gonna ask you to make a commitment. If you really want to see, the only way things are gonna happen is that if God's people pray. If God's people have a hunger and a passion and a desire to see God do something. It's not enough to have warm, fuzzy things in your heart saying, oh yes. It's all about taking those warm, fuzzy things that God's placed there and actually put them into actions and be consistent with it to the best of your ability. Because we know things pop up, that's understandable. But I'm gonna ask you to really pray this year, maybe in a new intensity that you didn't do last year, to really pray and pray in one area is on Friday mornings at 9.30 for an hour. Because if you think you have things to do, trust me, I have plenty of things to do. But I'm not going to forsake that over prayer. I'll have my prayer in the morning and then I still meet at 9.30. Because you know why? It can never hurt me by praying more, <laughs> you know? So that's like me, I think that's awesome. Daniel was praying three times a day. And that's how, why would a person pray three times a day? That's because he wanted to commune with the God he loves. And all of us, I think, should increase that. And you know, it's like when we sing, when we sing, it's not just singing a song in church time and worship, it's singing to God. And when you do that, and you really get into it, something happens in you. Something happens, something bubbles up. It's the Spirit of God that bubbles up. And then all of a sudden, you are now expressing praise to God. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. When the lips and the heart connect, it can't just be the lips, and it just can't be the heart. It's, it's in, in praise, it's the whole body coming together to worship God. And when we think of Christmas, we think in that Jesus left everything to come to earth because he so loved you. He left everything, and then he lived among us for 33 years. Now, when I think about that, I'm sure, and we see it in Scripture, Jesus had some times with, we, with us folk. Hmm? One time he said this, Oh, how long must I suffer you? <laughs> how many think that's really encouraging in the Bible? <laughs> Jesus saying, How long must I suffer you? You're not getting it. But yet Jesus always, 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 his hand was there to lift us up. Jesus always, always, always was there to instruct and help us. Ain't that good? Give God some praise in the house of the Lord because he's worthy. Um, so I just want you to know, keep that uh, time slot open in the new year on Friday mornings at 930. And let's see if for one hour we can come to, together. And I'll even go one step further is that if you do that on a continuous basis, I really believe God will start to do something different in you. You can't get in the presence of God on a continued basis without God doing something in you. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. <laughs> oh my. Well, as you know, we, were, uh, we are, um, I've been doing it a little bit differently because of different things happen on Wednesdays, but still taking that one day out of the week just to fast. And so lately we've been doing some special things on uh, Wednesdays just because, you know, I want some fellowship to go on. Uh, I think we need it, some fun. And uh, so I pick usually Saturdays, my day to fast. And it's even great just before service that God would just do a great work. But pick a day, a Wednesdays or another day to fast before the Lord. 
and uh, let's believe God would do some great things. Amen. Now, this Sunday, the Sunday we're living right now, this Sunday, tonight, we're going to celebrate Christmas. And so we're going to have a, tonight, uh, we're going to start here at uh, 6 o'clock, and we're going to have some time of uh, presentation, and then afterwards, we're going to go downstairs and have some kind of some traditional food and have some fun down there. And so we're just going to celebrate Christmas. I've been really trying hard to celebrate Christmas this year, not get so busy. Do you know all my Christmas shopping was done by Thanksgiving? Hmm? Come on, man, I'm happy. I, I, but I was done. Now, if you're still doing Christmas shopping and you hate me right now, I'm sorry. But I made a, I made a, I made a thing this year. I, I'm, I'm at the point in my life where I'm, t I'm done talking, and now it's time to do. And so I am doing a lot of things, maybe too many things at once. But, but I had all my Christmas shopping done by Thanksgiving, and um, I just want to say it feels fantastic. <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, you, you have to be intentional. Uh, you have to be intentional about the things you're, you're trying to accomplish or trying to do. And uh, so, but don't get so crazy with everything in Christmas that you miss the meaning. That's what happens so often. We miss the meaning because we're, we're so uptight. Look at your neighbor and say, stop being uptight. <laughs> I'll come down and sit with you, honey. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, uh, so anyhow, I want to invite everyone to um, invite someone on Christmas Eve service. That's always a beautiful time. As you see these beautiful flowers here, each one of these flowers represents in memory of honor of someone. You know, I tell people this all the time, the young people don't always catch it because they think they're invincible because they're young. But the reality is we only have one life to live. And we need to live it as strong and as great as possible. And we need to recognize that one day, and this is what helps me, one day I might represent a flower for someone else that would remember my life. And so the question I ask myself all the time is, what will my flower represent? Just a name? Or will that represent more than a name? Will it be an influence? Would it be that it making a difference? What would that flower represent? Just a challenge for each one of us to recognize that nobody's promised tomorrow, but we are promised. He holds our tomorrow. And so as we come across Christmas, Christmas can be very hard upon those that have, you know, had family members go on. And to go on to the point that one day we all want to be there. I mean, this is what Christianity is all about. Christianity is all, not about here, not at all about here. But we as believers focus so much too much about here. It's really about there. For God so loved the world that he gave. Why did he give? He gives so that we could be with him. And this is the message of the gospel. But if the church doesn't proclaim it and doesn't share it, it, it ain't up to us if people don't want to listen. Free yourself of that. I have. But I will go to the ones who will listen, because that's what God told us to do. And um, I want you to know that those that took flowers and remembered someone, we're going to have a special representation on Christmas Eve service for these flowers and what each flower represents. But can I just encourage you? Can I just encourage you to really start to think about your life and how you can make a greater impact? And please don't give me your age. I'm talking to a 96-year-old woman. We're very good friends. And I always encourage her to make a difference, even at 96. Someone say amen. amen. People can say, well, you know, I'm this old. Yeah, don't let your age be an excuse. That's just an enemy's tool. Say, well, your age. Your age is never the issue with God. Amen? Hmm. Okay. I'm going to move on now. Um, so I want to remind you, invite everybody out to Christmas Eve service, and we're going to try to make it really special, memorable, and uh, it's what it's really about. In 
if um, next year in 2022, I've been working on this thing for a while, I'm hoping to get it done. I'm only in infancy stage, but we're going to have a new way of sharing Jesus Christ. No matter where you are, you can be able to give people so much information and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what I'm asking for you today is just to pray for me, so clarity of getting it all together, to make it simple for you, not only to share the gospel with someone, but give them something that if they so choose, they'll have everything at their fingertip for their walk with God. Can you do that for me? <laughs> I was a little worried there for a second. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't sure I was among the breathing. <laughs> uh, all right, all right. I just, I just need a little prayer. It's, it's, it's going to take a little bit to pull together. I'm pulling together a lot of stuff all at one time and um, um, trying to do my best. But I, I do say I need some help. Um, that being said, um, let's, let's continue to pray for our services. And let's continue to pray for our Christmas Eve. Um, there's no Wednesday service this Wednesday, um, so but tonight, don't forget tonight, um, we're going to have a good time of singing and uh, having a, a really, really, really good time together. Look at your neighbor and say, Amen. Amen. I'm going on my boat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look at your neighbor and say, so glad you're here. But before, we, before we get started, before we get started, I, I wanted to take a special moment. I want to take a special moment, and I want you to pray for Pastor Flagstead. Um, he is um, needing strength. That was his request. I would ask that we would pray for strength. He's recovering. He's weak, very weak, um, but he's needing strength. And so could we just take a moment to a man who's dedicated many, many years. Um, how many is 19 years in this place? 18 years. Huh? No. How many years uh, did your dad serve here? I came in 01. The, Paula says 11 years. Yeah, sometimes I don't argue with her dates because she's usually right. <laughs> uh, 11 years uh, uh, here, him and his wife, 11 years, and that's a long, a long time. And so um, he's still sharing scriptures, and it was just, it was really great. Um, but can we pray right for him right now that God would strengthen him? Uh, Father, we join our hearts together to pray for our brother, Lord, our pastor. And God, we ask that you would give him the strength that he has asked for. God, that you give him the clarity of mind and strength of purpose. And I pray, Lord, that you give him more opportunity to share the gospel with the nurses and the doctors and those that come into his path. I pray, Father, right now, as we join our hearts together in one accord, your word says, when two or more together, there you are in the midst. And Lord, we ask a divine touch upon his body. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm so glad you're here. I just love when I tell people to say certain things and there's so much laughter after the, after the point. We've been on a journey about God's promise kept. Did you like the little uh, ornament you got last week? It looks a little bit like that on the screen, isn't it? <laughs> God kept the promise. And so we've been talking about a few things. First, we talk about Zechariah. And Zechariah, he had a problem with unbelief. An angel isn't before him, before him. Someone say before him. Speaking words that come straight from God's throne as he's in a room all by himself and he couldn't believe. He couldn't believe because he was stuck in the natural. 
He was stuck in thinking that it was over. He was old, his wife was old, and you know what? It wasn't going to happen. But he failed to understand with God, all things are possible. And sometimes we miss it. We miss it by a large space. We miss it. And Zechariah missed it. So he needed a little help. So the angel says, well, you don't want to believe the word. Let me, let me help you out here. You're not going to speak anymore until this is fulfilled. And that's exactly what took place. You had words of hope, but he had a heart of unbelief. And then we looked at Mary. It's just the opposite a little here, but yet they're a little bit the same. But there was a shift there at the end because, see, Mary was looking at life natural. She was seeing the way it was. Mary was thinking just the way she thought. And she just simply said, well, how are you going to do this, Lord? And the Lord simply tells her exactly what's going to happen. And then faith came in. And then she says, let it be unto me as you have said. I, I want you to understand that she saw the angel. She heard the words. She still said, well, Lord, how are you going to do this? I have never been with a man before. How am I going to be? How am I going to have a pregnant? How am I going to be pregnant? How am I going to have a child? In her mind, there was only one way she could get pregnant. And in your way, that's the only way it's going to happen too. For the most part. Unless you put technology involved. But I will say this. She was curious on how it was going to take place. But when she heard the result, she received it. I want you to understand that because she believed, she received an incredible gift from God. Because she understood with God all things are possible. Nothing is impossible with God. And then, therefore, her great response in verse 38, let it be unto me as you have spoken. I'm yours. I'm all in. I'm willing to take the journey. You see, when we're talking about hope, we have a world today that doesn't really understand hope. Really, they don't. The world believes in hope, but their hope is more of a wish list. I hope this happens. I hope I don't get in trouble. I hope I still have a job. I hope I still have uh, Social Security when I get my age. I hope, I hope, I hope. But that's just a wish list. But that's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is understanding what hope really is because hope comes from what we put hope in. And when we know the character of God and we know God's word and we believe in the character of God, the power of God and what God has said, then our hope is in him. And because we believe in his character and what he says is true, it causes us to have hope, a hope of expectation. A hope of belief because he's a God who says all things are possible. Nothing is impossible with me, God says. So this is a, this is changes everything. God says with him, all things are possible. And we say, I believe that even though I don't see it. Someone say, see it. There's a lot of things we don't see. A lot of things we don't see. And because we don't see it, it brings discouragement. Because we don't see it, it brings hardship. Because we don't see it, sometimes we're just like Zechariah. We don't believe it. But when we can stop seeing it in the natural and bring God into the equation, that's how it changes everything in our life. It changes our thinking. It changes our, 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 our future. It changes our words. It changes everything because, wait a minute, we are now inviting God into a present situation. I have just come to a conclusion that I no longer just going to look at things the way it is. I'm going to give you a little bit of a testimony here in some sense, because, see, there's been so many times where, you know, you just accept things. And then when you accept things, you start lowering your own expectations because of what's around you, because of this, that and the other thing. Everybody can pick something. But then you got to start saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is God big? Someone say, is God big? Is God big? You're supposed to say yes, yes or no. <laughs> is God big? Yes. Is he over your life? Yes. Is all things possible? Yes. Then here's my question. What are, you dreaming? what are you dreaming for him to do? If he's that big, then where are your expectations of God doing it? So I came to a point in life and I'm saying, okay, God, you know what? No longer am I just going to look at what I see because, wait a minute, God, you're over that. So now I have to change my thinking and, and, and put it towards what he says. You see what I'm trying to say? Yes. 
And this is, this is what's so important for us. And that's why when we look at this portion of Scripture, if you can hook up my PowerPoint for me. When we look at this Scripture that we have been trying to memorize here um, for some time, found in Romans 13. Still not hooked up. There we go. 13, Romans 15, 13. Look what it says. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you what? Trust him. That we would be filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Huh? I want you to understand, you, gotta, you want to be filled and overflow with the power of the Holy Spirit, but you have to trust him and you have to have hope because the God of hope wants to fill you with joy and peace. But those are the two things people, even Christians, walk in life without. They don't walk in joy and they don't walk in peace. I can't believe it. I don't know what's going to happen. Don't know what's going to happen. They don't have joy and peace. They're not walking in joy and peace. Why? Why are they not walking in joy and peace? Because they're not listening to the voice of God. They're listening to their own voice. And if we feed ourselves that voice, we will head in that direction. That's why it's always good to get close to God's voice, because we need it. I gave you an acronym. I should have asked you what the acronym was before I hit the switch, but I did. Does anybody know it? <laughs> yes. Oh, you encourage me. Hope. It helps open people's eyes. That's what Christmas does. That's what everything does. That's what it's all about, is opening our eyes. Now, I don't know about you, but we're going to talk about Joseph this morning. And God gave hope to him, and he helped Joseph open his eyes. And I don't know about you, but um, have you ever been in a trouble? And you were between a rock and a hard place. Raise your hand. You've been in trouble. You've been in a rock and a, a situation that was really hard. And you didn't know. And, and if you chose this, you had pain. And if you chose this, you had pain. And you were in that predicament. Have you been there before? No matter what you choose, there's going to be consequences. It's one of those moments. Well, Joseph is in one of those moments where he says, if I choose this, I'm going to have pain. If I choose this, I'm going to have pain. It's a typical situation. Have anybody ever been on a cruise ship? Hmm? Who, who's been on a cruise ship? Okay, a bunch of cruises. You know, the first thing you've got to do is learn how to put one of these on on a cruise ship. You know, I had get everybody together in little rolls and they teach you how to do this and put on the, you know. But I was thinking, you're on a cruise ship and you accidentally fall over. Now, if you've ever been on a cruise ship, they're pretty high. So you fall over, and now that ship doesn't even know you fell over, because you're all by yourself. You fall over, and now you see this ship just going away, and there you are in the water. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you feel like there's no hope. But a life preserver is hope. Let me tell you a true story. And Kevin, I'm sharing your story. A true story of uh, a situation that happened to a, uh, Kevin's, um, Paula's brother. He was working in the what's, Barren Sea on a tugboat. And um, him and his relative, another relative of his, were thrown overboard. And they're in raging seas, cold, cold, cold water. And his relative didn't think he was going to make it. My, uh, Kevin, Paula's brother, didn't have a life preserver. And his brother-in-law, was it? Brother-in-law? Took off his life preserver. I had all this untangled. I said to myself, I can't do too far out. I'm going to ruin a... But he took off his life preserver and he gave it to him. And it's like the individual who is on a cruise ship and all of a sudden sees a life preserver floating. He now has hope. He now has hope. And when he sees the life preserver falling off, he sees it. He runs for it. Today, my brother-in-law is alive 
because his brother-in-law gave up his life preserver for him. So you see, when you fall overboard on a boat and that boat don't know you fell overboard, you can swim for so long. And you don't know how long, and if you're in certain waters, you're thinking, wow, can I survive the cold? Can I survive the, the shocks? Whatever it may be. But if you see a life preserver, at least you've got something to hang on to. And today, God's going to give sort of like a life preserver to, to Joseph in the midst of a problem that he didn't know what to do. An angel from God's going to show up and give help. And you say, boy, I, I wish God would do that to me. How many ever thought that? Come on, raise your hands. Yeah, come on. I think everybody in the room, you bunch of liars. <laughs> I sometimes have said, God, it would be so nice if we could have a little help here. I could have the divine information straight from the throne to give me clarity to know exactly what I need to do, when I need to do it, and how to do it. Wow, it's a picture of hope, a life preserver is. Let's look at our portion of Scripture today. Let's look at this found in Matthew chapter 1 and look at verse 18. Let's look at the problem. The problem was, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. So, we all know the story, but for those that don't, we understand that Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. And before they could come together and consummate their marriage, she was found to be pregnant. Last week, we talked a little bit about the three stages of a Jewish marriage or a Jewish wedding. First was the engagement, early or mid. The fathers would get together and they would... Um, connect individuals together. My daughter with your son, your son with my daughter. And that would be an arranged marriage. I had a friend of mine in Bible school who had an arranged marriage. He was from India, and they arranged his marriage when he was nine. And then he said to me, my mother would kill me if I came home with an American woman. And I said, would she really kill you? And he said, yes. And he was complaining about his arranged marriage until he sent me a picture of the girl he married, a most beautiful girl. I don't know what the dude's problem was. <laughs> that, I thought, was a good arrangement. So you have the engagement, and then you have the betrothal. That's where Mary and Joseph was. And then you have the marriage, where the groom would come at his choosing, at the point where... He would do it unexpected and get his bride and take her to his home where they can consummate their vows and marriage. However, Mary gets pregnant in between when she's in betrothal. And betrothal, when you got betrothed, it, the only way to break it, you had to get divorced. That's how serious it was. It wasn't like our engagements. Here's a ring. We're engaged. And then all of a sudden, that's it, rings off, it's off. No, not with a Jewish uh, wedding or process. That you needed a divorce during a betrothal. And this is, where, this is where Joseph finds himself. One day, he finds his bride. The girl he's been waiting for all this time is now pregnant, and he knows it's not from me. No doubt, Joseph was excited to bring his wife home. Just think about it. Put yourself in, her, in his place. No doubt, he waited faithfully and made plans for his future, for his family and his future wife. And no doubt, it was a tough pill to swallow when he heard God was the reason why she was pregnant. I mean, just think of that for a second. How does that sound to you if a person says, listen, listen, God did this to me? Would you believe it? That was no different back then than it is now. It's one of those things that you just, you can't swallow. No doubt he felt betrayed. He was hurt. Because he had such anticipation to make his life with this woman. 
And before they're even married, she's now with child. Look at verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in his mind to divorce her quietly. Now, I want you to understand a little bit about what this works, because first of all, it gives a description a little bit about Joseph. He was a righteous man. And a righteous man is simply a man or a woman, anybody who's righteous, who's right in God's sight. It's an individual who's free from guilt and sin and who follows the divine moral law of God. And Joseph is a righteous man. We can see that he's righteous because he's a man of self-control. Did you ever see when he finds out that Mary is pregnant, he doesn't go off the wall? Hmm? Doesn't go for the gun? Doesn't go look around and say, who, who did this? He is self-controlled. And what he does is tries to do the right thing in the midst of it all. Because righteousness is not selfishness or vengefulness. But righteousness will always display compassion. Righteousness will always display compassion. A demonstration of compassion. And this is exactly what Joseph is doing. And so he says to himself, I am not going to put her to display publicly because if he did, they would stone her to death. So he says he's going to do it secretly. And when he says secretly, what he's going to do is he's keeping this to the chest and he's not saying why he's divorcing her. He's just divorcing her. He is not saying I'm divorcing her because she's been unfaithful. No, he is not giving no reason whatsoever. See, Joseph did not gossip the problem to people. He didn't take Mary's problem and start gossiping to everybody. Look what she did to me. Do you see what she did? Joseph didn't do that. You see, what Joseph did do, though, is that no doubt he took it to prayer. No doubt he wanted to do the right thing. Even though he felt that she had hurt him, he was not going to respond to retaliate. He says, okay, I'm going to do this the right thing. Why? He was a righteous man. And he didn't gossip. And he didn't tell, he didn't tell everybody the, her, her business and what took place. You know, gossip is a mark of a righteous man or woman. In Proverbs, we discover that gossip is a revealing the negative secrets of other people. Proverbs 20, 19 says, He who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with that gossip. 2 Corinthians 12, 20 says the Holy Spirit list gossip as a sin. But because Joseph didn't share this, but took it to God, he said, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give the reason why I'm divorcing her. I'm just going to divorce her. Therefore, therefore, nothing will happen to Mary, and I'm just going to have to be lonely because no doubt Joseph really wanted to marry Mary. No doubt, Joseph might have been really down. I want you to understand, he, you ever have a bad day? That's probably what Joseph was. His bride that he waited for so long is now pregnant with not his child. So he has now no wife. He now is going to divorce her. But something happens. Something happens. God throws Joseph a line. And the line of hope is a messenger from heaven. Because right now, Joseph is hurting. Either way, he's in pain. And sometimes when we're in pain, we don't see the hope in the midst of pain because pain doesn't seem to bring hope to the equation. But can I tell you that connected to God's line is always hope. Because he's a God of hope, full of joy and peace, if we trust in him. The bottom line, we receive God's hope, but we have to trust him. The joy and peace come when we trust him. He gave Joseph a line, and he throws him out a line, and this is where he opens Joseph's eyes. Look what the angel said to him. 
God throws him a line, a hope line, verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. I want you to get the, the lifeline, because here he is. He no doubt went to bed hurting. Because I don't know if you know this, men do cry. They just like to cry secretly. And I bet maybe on that bed that night, maybe he shed some tears, thinking his life is ruined. But with God, your life is never ruined. God picks, will help you pick up the pieces and make it even stronger. You see, this is what happens here. The angel of the Lord appears in a dream, and Joseph gets to hear the words from an angel. Right there in the present. Now, we don't know why the Bible says it was a dream and not a physical presence like Zechariah had and Mary had. People often say, why didn't the angel come like he came before? Well, all I can tell you is I don't know. <laughs> I can tell you this. Dreams always played a major part in the Old Testament. Dreams were very important uh, when God speaking. And God spoke to dreams to the forefathers and, and so many others. So God would speak in dreams all the time. Not always just to show up present-wise, but in, a lot in dreams. And so God spoke to him in a dream. And here it goes. The angel knows exactly who Joseph is. And this is how he knows. He says, Joseph, son of David. Not only knowing who Joseph was, but knowing his line. Knowing his line is important because that's going to help Joseph right now. No doubt he remembered later all the scriptures talking about the, his line and the line of David. The hope line. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. He's been struggling with that. That very thing. But one moment with God, God can give you clarity. The, the problem is we want clarity, but we don't want to put the time in to seek God's face, God's presence. We are so often we want God to do this and we want God to do that and we want God to do this and we get upset because he doesn't do this and God don't do it the way I want him to do over here and we get all bent out of shape with God because God doesn't do what we want him to do. Excuse me, but who's God? God knows exactly what to do. Amen. The problem is we're the problem. It's us and we have to take ownership of this. It's our action. It's our choices. It's what we have done. We can try to blame God all we want. Blame will never be at the foot of God. And so here's, here's God doing this work in Joseph's life, showing him exactly what he needs to hear. And could you imagine? He's probably in a deep sleep. He's seeing this, uh, he's seeing this angel. He's like living it like he's right there. And then the angel says, take Mary to be, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. Because what's in her is of the Holy Spirit. Could you imagine in the dream? Ding, 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 ding. Oh, I understand. See, that's a hope line. When you have hope, stay there. God will give you understanding. But if you want to hear something from God, pursue him. Don't just... Want God to do it all. I, 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 get, I get a little upset sometimes when people want God to do everything. They don't want to do nothing. They just want God to just do it. I'm sorry. God doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. There's a part that you and I play in the way that God works. And he will save his people from sins. This is a biggie. He didn't say he was going to bring Israel out of the bondage of Rome. But he was going to come and to save the people of Israel. Now, the people of Israel were looking for Jesus to come back, right? Or looking for the Messiah to come back and finally make a Jewish kingdom and rule and reign and get rid of those Romans. God was thinking something bigger. Not just for God's people, but the whole world. Because what's bigger than oppression, whether a government oppression or people oppression, is the oppression of sin. 
That's the really biggest thing that's out there, the sin. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and it came in the cradle to go to the cross and it was to, to finally fix the sin problem that separated man and God in relationship. And he says this wonderful word, he will save his people from their sins. A spiritual deliverance was coming. Look at this now in verse 22. Because a God of hope, you got to get this, a God of hope always has a promise. Someone says, God has a promise for me. I I, want to tell you this, that in order for you to see God's promise, sometimes you have to pursue him. You have to pursue God's word. You have to get passionate about getting to know God. Sometimes people say, well, I've been in the church for, you know, so many years. I don't care. I don't care how long you've been in the church. Because your relationship with God is only as fresh as you are in God. It's not all what God's done in your past. It's what is God doing right now? How close are you with God now? Because it's a journey of friendship. It's a journey of side by side. It's not about how much we know. It's not about how much we know. It's not how long I've been a Christian and give me a label. It has nothing to do with labels. It has everything to do with closeness and love. For our God, that we desire to be like a Mary and say, here I am. Do unto me as you have said. Do unto me. Here I am, God. I'm ready to be used of you. Flow through me as a vessel. Help me to be obedient to your ways. Look what it says here in verse 22 and 23. The God of hope always has a promise. All this took place. To fulfill what he, the Lord, had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is powerful because this is fulfilling scripture. Let me give you a couple of scriptures here. Some of the prophecies that's talking about this is Isaiah 7.14. It says a book, 700 years before Jesus actually came. It says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, and the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us, which we see in fulfillment of Luke one thirty-five. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Look at this one, another fulfillment of God's word. And look at Micah. Old Testament prophecy says, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least by the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Another 700 years in advance before Jesus has came. Fulfilled here in Matthew chapter 2, 4 and 6. When he called together all the people, chief priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Messiah was to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophets has written. Let's go to the most important one when we look at this in Genesis chapter 315. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and I will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The fulfillment really is found in 1 John 3, 8, in the purpose of Jesus coming. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Now, for those that don't understand Genesis 3, that's simply talking about the cross. And in the cross... When it's talking about crushing the head and bruising the heel on the cross, you were suffocating on the cross. And so everybody who was on the cross bruised heels. They were pulling up on their heels and their heels would be so bruised. And then it talks about the crushing. Jesus died and crushed the devil's authority. And he says, you may bruise his heels, but he will crush your head. You may afflict some pain of the crucifixion, but in the end, he's going to defeat all authority that you have. 
Because when you defeat the head, you defeat the vessel in which strengthens and causes life. The head is the authority. It's so powerful for you and I to understand. Look what it says here. God's hope is tied to obedience. Verse 24 and 25. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home to be his wife, but had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. This is a beautiful aspect that Joseph needed help in a very difficult situation. And God sent an angel to minister to him to help him. An intervention that took place in the divine work of God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You can believe it or not, but God's still doing these things throughout this world. He is still working out his plans. Do you know that? There are still things to be done. And God's messaging angels are in the midst. The Bible says, the Bible says you could entertain an angel and not even know it. So I would recommend each one of us to always be kind and always walk godly because you just never know who you may entertain. But even if they're just someone who needs help and may look like they're a street person, it's our responsibility to love every person, no matter where they come from or who they are, regardless. Look at your neighbor and say he's talking to you. The angel gave words of hope to Joseph. And did you understand how quick Joseph went out once he knew the words? Once he, got, once he received the truth, he acted upon it. Let me ask you something. When God asks you to do something really tough, how quick do you act upon it? You know? God woke you up one day, 4 o'clock in the morning, and says, um, call such and such. Huh? Can I call him at 9? Oh, we'll say, oh, we might say, if I call that person at this time, Lord, they'll kill me. But you don't know. What God knows is maybe that person is having a really bad moment. They're not even sleeping. Maybe they're have really discouraged. And all of a sudden, if they received a call for you with words of hope, could you imagine how that can change the scenario? Obedience is always better than sacrifice. God wants obedience, and that's exactly what the type of man. Because if you're going to receive the hope of God, it's going to require some type of obedience on your part. So many people have never seen God's full circle because they quit in the process. And boy, have I seen that so often. They quit in the process. God can't even finish what he's trying to do because they put their hands to the plow and then they take it off. They put their hands to the plow and they take it off. I want to share something with you from Matthew, the book of Matthew. I like this part here. I think it's great because God's promise in the journey, God gives the directions to the Magi. The angels show up, even, even the Magi, Magi verse two, chapter 2, verse 10, the Magi, book of Matthew. When the Magi saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary and Mary and they bowed down and worshipped him. When they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and with incense and with myrrh, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Isn't that awesome? Here comes the messengers again that gave them a dream and said, don't trust Herod. He's not a man that you think he is. Do not go back to him and tell him about the child. And because these wise magi understood who Jesus would someday be, they listened to the Lord. Isn't that awesome? I want you to think, suppose there was no interaction of God in this story. Let's take out the angels. Let's take out God, God guidance, the guidance of God. Let's take it out. What would happen? The Spirit of God always wants to lead us and teach us. But we have to have hearts to listen. We have to have hearts. Even the Magi, God's intervening. There's a, a work God's doing here to protect the child because the child was under threat. 
The Jewish people were under threat of annihilation because God's trying to prevent the prophecy from being fulfilled. There's a battle out there. And saints, we're still in the battle. We're still in the battle. The Magi, they bring gold, representing kingship. Gold's mentioned 417, approximately, depending on what translation you're in. Frankincense, representing deity, mentioned 22 times in the Bible. And myrrh, representing sacrifice. Those three elements are describing the life of Jesus, who he was and what he would do. God's always thinking these three things through. God's always trying to work in your life too. We have been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. So they didn't. So God provided protection. God provided intervention. God provided um, instruction. God's still doing that with you. What do you need instruction for? What do you need guidance for? What do you really need from God? And then stop talking and start listening while you're in prayer. And just sit sometimes letting God give opportunities to speak. Just the other day, I, I, I mean, I fight with this myself. Just the other day, I'm in prayer. Had a great moment in prayer. I mean, the presence of God was in the place. It was a marvelous moment in prayer. And when I was done with the moment, I left. And I, I got up the stairs and a little voice said, Aren't you going to wait to listen? And I'm like, Ugh. never even occurred to me that I'm trying to stop to listen more. But because I got into this rhythm that we pray and we just get done what we want to say. And then we get up and get going with life. Not ever thinking God may have something to say to you. And sometimes we're so quick to move. The thing is, we just, we want to just go through our little rope. Well, I say this, I do this, I say this, I do this, I'm done. No, that's not prayer, and that's not time with God. That's ritual, because God's going to change things up on you. Time with God should never be the same. Should never be the same, because God's not the same. He's going to do something different, because you're at a different stage in life. You, you need different things, and God will meet you, but you've got to put yourself in that position. And not with like, well, okay, God, get me five. God, I'll get you five minutes. You got five minutes. <laughs> I tell people, if that's all you got, give God five. But a hungry heart is not going to be giving God five because they're hungry. They're just going to give God. Look at this process. Joseph is one individual in the Christmas story that actually gets four divine visits from angels. In his dreams. In Matthew chapter 2, we find this in verse 13. And when they had gone, this is the Magi, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take you at the child and the mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said to the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. I, I want to get you this in a moment. This is kind of funny. The angel comes and they leave at night. They leave, have to leave at night. But could you imagine this? Herod is going to kill your child. Mom and dad, how fast would you move if you got a dream saying they're gonna, someone's going to come kill your child? First thing we say is, where am I going to go? The guy says, go to Egypt. Hosea 11, verse 1, is where the prophecy of I should call my son out of Egypt come from. Hosea 11, 1. God's always doing something wonderful in his heart and life. Look at this. Another two more times in the third visit and the fourth visit comes all in this scripture right here in Matthew chapter 2. Follow along. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in the dream of Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take your child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. So now he's calling him out of Egypt to Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, 
took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Achilles was reigning in Judah, Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in the town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he would be called a Nazarene. I want you to see this process that God had all of this time. God had a process, and God had a lifeline that he gave just in the nick of time, just in the nick of time. I don't know about you, but I don't know what you need. God does. Those watching online, I don't know what you need, but I know God knows exactly what you need. And sometimes, some people just need some hope. Hope that the situation can change. Uh, one of the greatest ways of you changing the situation, here it goes, want to change the situation? Change you. If you want to change the situation, change you. God gave a lifeline God wants to give a lifeline to you as well. If you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's the lifeline you need. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of glory of God. The scripture tells us again that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. This is the reason why Jesus came to earth. This is the main reason why Jesus came to love you and me. And the greatest gift that you can ever give is giving of yourself to Jesus Christ. One day, one day, every single person on the faith of the earth is going to see Jesus Christ face to face. One day it's going to happen. I know we live in a world that wants to take God out of the picture. And eventually they will. But you know what? God will always have a church. God will always have a church because he will always provide the truth here. But one day he's coming back for the church. And we need to recognize and live the life and make a difference and do the best we can. Someone say best we can. And the first thing is to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. To ask God, forgive me of my sins, God, come into my heart. Simple as that. Forgive me of my sins, come into my heart. I believe you died on the cross for me. And on the third day, you rose again. He defeated death is when he died on the cross. And when he rose again, he defeated death, grave, and the sin. He completed what he came to do. This is what's so beautiful. Christmas is the starting work. Easter is the finish work. And because we understand this, I pray faith arise. I pray that you start living by faith and stop listening to all the, all the static around you and get to know God. Let God get to know God. Because if you're not getting to know him, you're going to listen to all the static and it's going to be, it's going to be a mess in your head. It's going to be a mess in your head because you're listening to all the stuff around you. You need to push, push, push up, push in, push into the presence of God and God will do a work. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now that you would bring hearts ever so close to you. I pray, Lord, as they do their part, learn of your ways, your word. I pray you give them the power of the Holy Spirit to do your works. I pray, Father, they become worshipers of you. God, I ask right now that you would touch lives. And this day, this day, that hearts would say, God, here I am, forgive me. I give you my life. This Christmas, this Christmas, I give you my life. As you gave your life on the cross for me, I now give my life to you so that I can live eternally with you. Because hell is not the place that I want to call home. Heaven is the place I want to call home. In your presence, I ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give God some praise in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed be his name. Blessed be his name. Well, we thank you for joining us today. Let's continue to believe that God is going to do a work in all of our lives and in his church, despite our current circumstances. If you would like to support the ministry of Salem First Assembly, you can do so by mailing to 430 Route 45, Salem, New Jersey, 08079, or by visiting our website, at SalemFirstAG.org. Please join us for service next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. or you can watch service every Sunday afternoon on Facebook at Salem First Assembly or YouTube at Salem First AG. You can also listen to the message every Tuesday on Podbean. 
Have a blessed rest of your day. Let's remember to be a blessing and that life is living in faith every day.